And welcome everybody to our fifth reskilling for the future of work meeting. We've been doing some phenomenal work. Um, and on the next slide, uh, here's the agenda for today. Um, we're going to do brief introductions. I want to give as much time as we can to our wonderful guest speaker, who I'll introduce uh, in a moment, Peter Capelli. He's going to be talking about um, his recent book and also uh, other work that he's been doing for years. I've been a big fan and follower of Peter. I actually use his, some of his HBR articles in my MBA classes. Um, then we're going to be doing three breakout sessions. Um, you can see the topics here, and I'm going to just highlight them now so you can think about which one you would like to join. We're going to give you the choice. So in group one, we're going to be talking about a really important issue of how can human resources hiring practices be revisited to provide greater opportunities for underemployed or long-term unemployed. And I'll be facilitating group one. Group two, which will be facilitated by Sam Couchy, who we heard last time, the founder and CEO of One Huddle, will be talking about how can we upskill employees whose jobs may be reduced or eliminated. And we were talking about from everything from automation and AI and robotics, et cetera. And the third group, which will be facilitated by Noah Gaffney, the executive director of the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation, is gonna be on how can we ensure that workers returning to remote and hybrid environments have equal opportunities for advancement as those who return to the office. And there's been a lot of uh, conversations about that. So just to remind everybody what we're doing here on the next chart, we have been for over a year now uh, talking about the future of work. Uh, the RICSI, with the support of many students, did an extensive report and presentation and symposium on the future of work. And as a result of that, we formed this task force working group, which um, we're here today. And what we're trying to do is look for how we can prepare people, both current employees and future employees, for meaningful, purpose-driven, equitable employment, and how we can better serve their skill development needs of all the stakeholders in society. And doing this while integrating things like sustainability, ESG, social responsibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's the context for what we're doing. And we did set up five immediate, or sorry, four immediate uh, goals that we are have been uh, working towards and will be sort of synthesizing at our next meeting, which will be our last meeting for 2021. So we have looked at the current situation in New Jersey, as well as the overall US in terms of skill development. We have a ton of fabulous resources on the, uh, you can see on the Google Drive or the table of contents that's attached to your invitation. We keep updating that. And we've been looking at the critical skills, um, the, what we call, we used to call the soft skills. Now we call them power skills or human skills as well as uh, other skills that are needed by employers for the next three to 10 years and to begin to build new pathways for skill development, to identify what are the barriers and opportunities for skill development, to make it more accessible to all. And we've talked about mobile apps and, and Sam Couchy gave us some wonderful uh, insights about that. And last time ETS, Educational Testing Service, gave us a whole idea of what they're doing to on identifying and assessing the critical skills that are needed. And finally, we have been and are proposing viable solutions. Um, so this is action oriented to benefit people, um, such as the individual portable training accounts that has now been actually um, brought into being through uh, the Murphy governor's uh, administration. So um, with that, um, I think we're gonna turn it over to Peter. And uh, if you haven't already, please identify and introduce yourself on the chat. And let me introduce Peter while he's pulling up his slides. So Peter is the George W. Taylor Professor of Management at the Wharton School and Director of Wharton Center for Human Resources. I'm not going to read his whole bio because that would take the whole time. He was recently named by HR Magazine as one of the top five most influential management thinkers. 
by NPR as one of the 50 influencers in the field of aging and was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources. He's a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal. He writes a monthly column for HR Executive Magazine and his work on performance management, agile systems and hiring practices as other, well as other workplace topics has appeared multiple times in the Harvard Business Review. His latest book is The Future of the Office, Work from Home, Remote Work, and the Hard Choices We Face. So please join me in welcoming Peter. Good. Thank you, Gina. It's a pleasure to be with you folks. And I think just in terms of a process thing, I, I am happy to stop along the way if you have questions. And uh, Gina, however you want to manage that, if you want to chat them in, and Gina, feel free to monitor them and stop me if there's a question. Uh, you know, I'm used to being interrupted, so it's not. Uh, sure, we'll look at the really chats. Fun. Thank okay. you. Okay, good. So let me say just a couple of things about your overall theme, which is something that I have, have been interested in for a long time and frustrated by for a long time. And let me give you, as the MBA students say, uh, what the big takeaway is here at the beginning, even before I start. And that is um, the big change since I began my academic career is the extent to which workforce issues, <clears throat> excuse me, have become a business. And uh, the extent to which our interest in these topics has been driven not so much by employers anymore, really, um, but by the community around employers um, who are advocating things. Uh, and here's an example of that. I mean, we're all familiar with the millennial stuff, right? And the generational differences stories. And you may not know, it's amazing how many people don't know that the National Academy of Sciences last summer issued a report on this, all the generational stuff. And in their eloquent phrase, they said, using generational differences in management is not consistent with science, which is another way of saying they found no evidence for any of this generational stuff, that it's simply not true. Not only are the individual claims not true, but the idea that there is a separate millennial cohort or there is a Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Q, Gen Z uh, is not true. And frankly, the reason why this has perpetuated is that no demographer has ever made any of these claims. And the demographers um, just think the whole idea is crazy. They're basically just confusing age effects, that is things that happen to people as they get older and claiming that they are something unique to the, to the generation. You know, the skill issue claims, um, I wrote about these about uh, seven or eight years ago, after the Great Recession, when we still had lots of unemployment and the employers were complaining that there was nobody to hire. And of course, that was a, a big myth. That wasn't, simply wasn't true. They were just changing what they were expecting from candidates and couldn't easily find it. And, you know, we have much the same story on AI. So I wrote a review of the literature empirical literature for this for the European Union last year. And there's precious little evidence so far that anything to do with contemporary data science has eliminated jobs. And one of the explanations for that is pretty easy to think about it, that a lot of these innovations in data science are actually creating new functionality. They're not simply designed to eliminate tasks. And even if you eliminate a task, it doesn't necessarily eliminate a job because jobs have are composed of lots and lots of tasks, right? But there's a, a lot of things going on and here's the biggest one. They, they all have to do with changes in management practices. So there are things that employers can control and the biggest changes in my lifetime have all been about those issues. You know, the rise of shareholder value is kind of an obvious one, but um, so are different expectations that employers have and different ways of doing business, uh, particularly, you know, associated with the breakdown of lifetime employment and the belief that having flexibility is crucial and the way you can get that is by not having permanent employees, right, is an assumption which is driving a lot of our problems. So I spent uh, a long time in Washington, more than 10 years, on this question of skills. I ran a research center for the U.S. Department of Education on that topic and uh, with a colleague at, uh, in the ed school here. And the big thing, here's the big story from that, is that when we would talk to employers then, so this was the early mid-90s, 
here's what they would say about skills and workers. They said, we don't care about skills. Give us somebody we can train and we will go from there, right? When you talk to employers now, they say something quite different. They say, we need to have the skills already before we hire people. That's an enormous change. I mean, it, it is a paradigm breaking change. And that is the heart of what you folks are wrestling with is that we have employers who are less and less engaged in the process of managing talent, but particularly developing and training people. You know, the extent to which we have data on training, which is lousy, it suggests that there was very little training going on in the first place. It seemed to collapse quite a bit, uh, even before the Great Recession in the 10 years or so before, the amount of people, percentage of people getting training fell by a lot, employer provided training. And no one thinks it went up in the Great Recession, right? So the big change is now employers are kind of demanding that employees or candidates already have the skills they want in order to hire them. And boy, that is a big lift. Uh, and it's particularly hard for new people entering the workforce, and it places a particular burden on the education system. Uh, I wrote a book about this a couple of years ago about college, uh, mainly because I was irritated by my economist colleagues who kept saying everybody has to go to college, right? And even though college is a wonderful thing, and those of us who are in it, right, would like people to keep coming, uh, but the idea that going to college is necessarily a great payoff for individuals is simply not clear. It, it is true that if you've already got a college degree, you're way better off. But the fact that, you know, maybe 40% or so, it's hard for us to know it precisely, of people who go to college never graduate. And we know because of sheepskin effects that if you don't graduate, you don't get much of a bang at all uh, out of going to college, but it could cost just about as much. <clears throat> you take out a lot of loans, you go to college, you don't graduate. It's, 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 a, it's really bad for your lifetime careers. And colleges have sort of responded to this lack of training by creating job title, I mean, uh, majors, which sound like job titles, right? So uh, my colleagues in schools around Philadelphia, um, our colleagues at Drexel, for example, have a major in casino construction management. Seem pretty specialized, I would think, right? Or St. Joe's has a major in um, pharmaceutical marketing marketing, which is not drug pushing, I don't think, but it certainly sounds like it. It is, you know, marketing specifically tailored to the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, this is all the kind of stuff that a generation ago you would have learned inside employers. And now it's kind of being pushed out and it has its, of course, its own risks, right? So that's my sense of the bigger picture here, having spent a lot of time around these topics. Um, but let's talk about the future of the office now, and particularly this idea of working from home uh, and the extent to which this might present some reasonably unique challenge, <clears throat> if not to individual employers, uh, for sure to the individuals who might be entering the workforce, right? And what are we going to do with those folks and how do we manage that? when we are moving toward a model where, you know, maybe more people are actually working from home. What, what's that story like? So let's see if uh, you can see my slides. I think you should be able to. It says uh, the future of the office. And let me begin with a quick little anecdote here. And this is uh, from Google, which you probably know that Google was a company that sort of made staying in the office famous. Right. So the idea at Google has been for a long time, which is now widely regarded as the number one place for new hires to want to go. It's in college student surveys, always ranks the number one place to work. Interesting, it ranks that way around the world, even in countries where there are no Google employees, which shows you a lot about the power of marketing, right? And the ability of Google to sell this story. The key to the kind of Google model was that they really wanted you to be in the office. And what they got a lot of attention for was providing all these perks and amenities that made it very attractive for you to be there. They also paid people a stipend if you would live close to the campus, you know, offsetting some of the cost of living issues because they wanted you to be there more. And they figured if you live far away, it was harder to commute, probably right. 
Uh, and, you know, they had all these fabulous perks. You could have your dog walk to bring your dog to work. You could get your hair cut there. They would do your dry cleaning, you know, anything to keep you there because they thought, you know, innovation happened from these social interactions and all this stuff, right? And as of about a month ago, they've now said, okay, 20% of you, I guess, based on the job, can just leave the office, go work wherever you want in the world, relocate. Um, another 20% of you can move anywhere you want as long as you're close enough to another Google office to get in there, I guess, when you need to. And the other 60%, the remainder, you can take a month, a year and go somewhere else and work if you want, not counting your vacations, right? And uh, you can also work from home during the week. I think it's two days a week, right? So we had this paragon of being in the office company now telling people, you need to go home. And the other thing about Google, if that's not puzzling enough, uh, the biggest purchasers of commercial real estate during the Great Recession, I mean, during the, uh, the pandemic, there's so many greats here, isn't there, um, has been the tech companies like Google. So they're snapping up commercial real estate at the same time that they're sending all their employees away. So what do they actually think? Well, they're not saying, right? Uh, but it does indicate how puzzling um, the experience is, even for people who are trying to learn from watching what employers are doing. It's just, just not clear. Uh, and let me add a couple of facts uh, about what I think is going on um, that are not in my slides because they're, they're quite recent. One just came in yesterday. Um, and the first is, that uh, employers, this is from real estate uh, economists, they have good data on things, right? And they're looking at card swipe data to look at occupancy in current offices. And if you look across the country, if you look, for example, in the state of Texas, two thirds of office workers are already back in the office. Right? And around the country, it's much lower. It's about a third. In Philadelphia, it's about a third. Uh, but the punchline there is that a lot of people are already back in the office. We went from a peak of, in census data, more than a third of people across the entire labor force were working remotely, down to now it's about 11%. So a lot of this story is kind of already over on the quiet, and that is employers have been bringing people back to the office. Um, the other things I've, I've learned that are new is that in looking at the commercial real estate plans for offices going forward, a non-trivial percentage, I think it's about 24%, are planning office space with no private offices anymore, which I find really puzzling. Certainly, they must be thinking about some kind of work from home thing. But we also know that the worst thing for people in a pandemic is to have shared office space, right? Like open offices, which by the way, all employees seem to hate. Now, the reason they persist, of course, is they're cheaper than regular offices. Uh, and the third thing is a survey that was done by Slack looking, they surveyed executives and they surveyed sort of non-executive employees. And what they found this maybe this is not too surprising, is that the executives are far more interested in everybody coming back to the office than our regular employees. It's another way of saying the executives are planning to be back, right? Uh, and the other thing is about two thirds of the executives reported that they were, were not consulting their employees in the decisions about work from home going forward. So this suggests to me that we, if you're gonna bet on this, uh, I would bet that we're gonna have a whole lot more return to the office as it traditionally operated than the current stories in the press might report. Uh, I don't think that's a great thing, but reading the tea leaves and what the employers are actually doing, that's kind of the way things are looking, right? But it might not be that way for everybody. And one of the things that would be most interesting about this current context is it's quite possible that employers might diverge in terms of what they're doing. You know, what they typically do is they follow what everybody else is doing. They're, and that's one of the reasons why we have a bit of a stalemate right now. So many employers have just not said what they're doing. And uh, I think they're waiting to see what everybody else does. But in the meantime, we have a bit of a lockup in the labor market, which we might talk about uh, a little bit at the end, if you'd like, about what's actually happening now uh, and why people are not, despite all the noise about um, high quit rates, it's actually not really so true 
And in particular, evidence suggests that job search is actually down, which is quite astonishing given how many job openings there are. Um, but maybe we could talk about that in a little bit. All right, so let's see if we could talk a little more about um, what is going on with work from home? So here's a survey. Uh, you know, none of these surveys are great because they're all commissioned by vendors for the most part. This was commissioned by McKinsey. They have maybe more money to spend, so maybe maybe their survey is a little better. But this is what they uh, found from surveys of regular employees, and what they found <clears throat> before COVID, not surprisingly. Um, most people like to be on site. Um, hybrid meant occasion, you know, hybrid just means everything except everybody's remote and everybody's in the office, right? It's just everything in between, right? There's always been a fair amount of interest in more flexibility from employers and the ability to work from home on occasion. So what are they finding? They say post-COVID, we're not post-COVID, but this was a couple of months ago, right? the percentage of people who want to be permanently remote is actually not that great. And even if you think they're off by a lot in the survey, it's still not that big a number. You know, the idea that everybody wants to move to Montana uh, and continue working there is just not true. Uh, the big change, not surprisingly, is how many people really want a hybrid arrangement now, right? Uh, that's the big change. The, the question of what the employers want is, is different. Now, if you're an employer, you might say, well, um, uh, what should we do here? The employee view on this is, well, things seem to work pretty well during the pandemic when we were remote. So why don't we keep doing this? So this is a survey that was done by Forrester and uh, commissioned by Indeed. And it looks at the beginning of the pandemic and then sort of later in the pandemic. And you can see that um, most everything is better, that the employees, you know, after a year or so in the pandemic seem to like things about their work better. Here's the really stunning one. And that is they feel their trust in their employer has gone up and they feel they're learning something at work has gone up a lot. Uh, they like their managers better. Uh, that one's kind of quirky, right? If you think about it. So I like my supervisor better. I never see her. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, I'm really happy with my supervisor because I don't see her much. Uh, that's a little quirky. But I think there's a lot of kind of Hawthorne effect stuff going on here effectively, right? And we're all in this pandemic together. And at least initially, we were trying to keep our companies or our organizations going. We were trying to keep a lot of society going. Uh, there was a great leveling that went on um, and a humanizing that went on with our bosses when you're seeing their kids and their dogs running around the, the TV, all that kind of stuff, you know, on your video. Um, so all that, I think, created a different environment. But in particular, you know, like when pe people say they liked they like working from home better, we haven't asked very much why they liked it better. What is it about it they like better? And we're drawing all kinds of assumptions from it. But my sense is what people liked the best is they liked the control and autonomy they had over their time. Uh, the bosses weren't micromanaging them because they couldn't do it, right? Uh, and that that's what they liked better. The question we wanna ask ourselves though is how much of that will persist if we move into a, a different post-coronavirus context? I don't think all of it will persist. I, I don't think this, we're all in this together and we're trying to keep society going, will continue for very long now that it appears that, you know, there is kind of life a little after vaccines, right? So that's something for us to think about. Um, I don't think our, let me skip over our poll because uh, it's not uh, clear how well it's gonna work uh, remotely, but let's, uh, add some sort of caveats to what we think we know, right? Um, the first is things did work far better than we thought they were going to work, but there's some other things going on as well, a couple of which I already mentioned, but you know, business was down. So in most organizations, it wasn't that hard to get everything done because there wasn't as much work to be done. And the economy was floating on a ton of government support. So you know, businesses were not struggling the way we might have expected that they would. But here's the big difference going forward, right? It's one thing if everybody is working from home because we have to. It's another if we ask people 
to raise their hands and say, who wants to work from home? And it turns out this is something we know a fair bit about, as you probably know, that telecommuting is not a new idea. It got going in the after the dot-com period. Actually, it started during the smog era in Los Angeles, where they were trying to cut commuting down to reduce pollution, air pollution. But it's been studied a lot. There's probably 20 or 30 studies of telecommuting, right? People who are working remotely. And the punchline from those studies is that the people who are the remote workers, on the work front anyway, everything is worse for them, right? They get promoted less often, uh, their wage increases are lower, they're less committed, they're less engaged in the work. And it's not too hard to imagine why this is. Just imagine that you have three colleagues, you're doing the same work, you're all good workers, two of them are going to be in the office with the bosses, and you're going to stay home. Who do you think is going to get ahead? given the modern workplace and how we know things operate, and people who are close to the bosses are gonna do better, right? They're gonna get first dibs on projects and things. They're able to show off more uh, to the bosses. Uh, they got better information all around. You know, it's, I don't think anybody's shocked to hear that, right? Um, but it is something for us to, to think about uh, when we start thinking about work from home remotely, it's not going to be like it was during the pandemic for lots of reasons. But the biggest is if we're asking people to self-select, um, you know, we sort of know how that's going to play out. And we've heard lots of employers kind of maybe a little too candidly talk about this. The investment bankers in New York have basically said that people who are committed will come to the office. You may remember the Washington Times editor who said people who are not in the office, it's, they're the ones who get laid off, you know, and her employees went on strike the next day. <laughs> so there's also, I guess, a lesson about keeping your mouth shut uh, there if you're the boss, right? Um, employees seem to like it, but not quite as many as we might think looking at the news, right? So that's something to think about. Um, and when we think about employees during the pandemic, we're thinking mainly about people who are kind of mid-career. We haven't spent a lot of attention on new hires, so we're the second year into the pandemic. And so we've been hiring people for two years. Uh, I can tell you that we hired people in my department at Wharton who I have never met. And I think this is not unusual in organizations, right? What's the experience for those people? I don't, I don't think anyone really should think that their experience is better. When, you're, when you start a job and you're working remotely, you haven't met anybody yet. And can you imagine your graduates and our graduates who get a job, let's say in New York or San Francisco, and before they get the job, the employer says, great news, uh, you can just stay home. We don't have to, you don't have to be in the office, right? Well, the whole reason for taking those jobs was to be in the center of the action, right? And that's where you meet people, 22% of American report that they met their significant other at work in the office, you know, I mean, this is a very different experience for young people beginning their careers than it is for people like me, who have been in the organization a long time, I know my way around, it doesn't matter that much if I'm not there. We haven't thought very much about the new hires, <clears throat> but presumably this is something that you folks are, are, are thinking. Uh, Interesting on commuting, so there's some evidence from the Department of Transportation that the reduction in driving is not nearly as much as you might think. There's an overall reduction in driving, but the amount of time that people, people spend driving during normal work hours has gone up. So when people are home, they're driving more, basically, right? So it is reduced driving, but not as much as one would think. Hours of work, at least in the organizations that seem to have measured this, suggest hours of work are up. That's not necessarily a bad thing if you can choose when you're working. And some of it is just a question of counting, right? But we have seen in organizations where they can track online use that there's now a kind of more serious second shift after work. I mean, after dinner time, right? Where people are back on the internet doing computer-based work. People with kids, especially, right? So. It isn't necessarily the case that people are working less. Uh, there's better evidence that they're probably working more. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, right? If they have control over what they're doing when. 
the reports about stress being up, I suspect that a lot of that is dual career and people with kids um, who are reporting that one. And I'm not sure that it's the work from home per se that's the issue there. I think they would have been more stressed out if they couldn't work from home, uh, particularly if they couldn't have a job, that would be really stressful. So uh, I don't know exactly what we make of the stress, one, right? Um, but everything is not exactly as it, it seems in this. But here's the big question. For employees, we pretty much know what's in it from work from home. If you wanted to relocate and spend the rest of your time in some resort location, remote work, permanent remote work, it's pretty clear what you get out of that. If it's hybrid where you get more control over when you need to come in the office, it's also pretty clear what you get out of that, right? It is not so clear what the employers get out of it, right? Now, if you're talking about permanent remote, it's very clear what employers get out of that. They're gonna take your office away, right? So in March of 2020, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, I saw a CFO survey and 34% of the CFOs were already planning to cut their commercial real estate footprint. And that was, you know, before we knew this thing was even gonna last very long, right? Uh, that was March of 2020. The CFOs like it for that reason. Um, the other thing, which is extremely creepy, is in Silicon Valley, and you probably know, you know, those companies were kind of the leader in telling you you could work remotely. Uh, and now they're walking it back. Uh, but they're walking it back in a way that you, you might not notice. They're walking it back by telling you you're going to have a pay cut if you want to work permanently remote. The first way they did this was sneaky and extremely duplicitous. It was for IT workers. They're saying, we're going to pay you based on the local labor market where you relocate, right? As if that kind of made some sense to people. But if you think about it, if you're a Silicon Valley C++ mobile app programmer and you go to um, the Grand Tetons, Jackson Hole to live, there's no labor market for C++ mobile app programmers doing high-end work in the Grand Tetons. I'm sorry, there just is not, right? This is a national labor market for those folks. And the reason they're paid so much in Silicon Valley is because they're paid so much everywhere. It's not that, you know, Silicon Valley pays people a lot because it's expensive to live there. It's expensive to live there because Silicon Valley companies pay people a lot. You might get paid less if you're working someplace else, but frankly, all the really high-end stuff or the most high-end stuff is done there. So it's not the same labor market. So the next thing that they're now saying is, oh, it's gonna be cost of living. Right. Um, if you move someplace cheaper to live, we're going to cut your pay by that amount. That amount. I don't think they they're serious about that either in terms of a principal position. And I always suggest to people who work there, tell them you want to move to Hong Kong, which is thirty percent more expensive than Silicon Valley, and see if they offer you a pay raise. Uh, let me bet that they're not going to do it. I mean, this is just a pretty cynical way, driven by CFO interest, to see if they could get something back for giving employees something the employees would want, right? And I don't think it's going to, well, is it gonna work? I think what I hear from people there is that, and now it's now 20%, I think on the slide I said 10%, they're now talking about pay cuts of about 20% if you wanna move and work remotely and people aren't taking it up. So I think this is kind of a, just a subtle way of walking back those initial offers I think initially they did it because they thought they would gain an advantage against their competitors. Since they all hire from the same people, Facebook was the first one in and, uh, and Twitter and you know, Amazon and Google, all those high-end programming companies, right? They're competing for the same people. So I think they, said, they thought initially they could grab a lot of talent by saying this. And the other companies like Google, my sense is they felt they needed to follow quickly or they would lose out in this labor market competition. But now that it looks that not everybody's doing that, uh, I think they're walking it back. So I think that's kind of what's going on there. Um, there is this other issue, which is more important, I think, for you folks to think about. And that is some employers are saying, well, this is great. We can now recruit, if you don't have to come to the office from any place in the country, and we can snap up the big talent. People don't have to relocate, right? Um, the, the part we're not talking about there is that also means outside the U.S., right? So you don't need a visa if you're going to employ somebody 
who is staying outside the US. It's where you do the work that matters, it's not who your employer is, right? So um, maybe that is just an even easier way to engage workers in other countries where they are cheaper, you know? So that's something we haven't heard very much about, but it's clearly what they're thinking about, particularly in the tech world, right? Okay, how about hoteling? Uh, some of us are old enough to remember that. Um, and some employers say they're gonna do this. PwC in Europe has said this, that they're gonna take away your office, but we still expect you to come in. But when you come in, you're gonna get an assigned office. And that way we can save on real estate. That's the reason for doing that. We can still cut our footprint. Right? The problem with hoteling, as you might remember, is that it was not really very popular. Uh, the employees hated it. It started in Silicon Valley. And within about seven years, there were articles in the business press saying, whatever happened to hoteling? Um, because it turned out the employees liked to be able to control some office space of theirs. And the reason you went into the office too was to see your own worker, your work group, your team of people and your colleagues and friends. But there's no reason to think you're gonna get an office near them if you're coming into hoteling. In fact, companies that are doing, that have done this create special office space for hotel employees, right? So you're likely to be by yourself. What's the point of coming into the office at all if you're gonna do that, right? You might as well go to meet at Starbucks with your, with your fellow workers, right? Um, there's also, I think, an increased push toward open offices in part as a way to deal with this. You know, open offices are disaster with infectious diseases and everybody hates them. I mean, the, all the evidence suggests it doesn't lead to collaboration. It actually reduces it. And uh, of course, it's a disaster if you're worried about getting sick, right? Um, so it's possible the market may demand it. Uh, and we still are wondering a little bit about that. We, we will see. Um, and then there's this issue that's happening in some places where they've already started to cut deals, particularly with management level employees, allowing them to work from home. You don't have to move here. Um, are there coercive comparisons with existing employees? Of, of, for sure, right? So I think the, the companies are getting themselves maybe in a little trouble on that one. They've already started allowing some people to do it on an ad hoc basis. And I think by the way, ad hoc basis is really a bad, bad thing. So I just saw in this real estate survey, uh, a statement that said 41% of the companies were um, going to allow their hybrid decisions to be made by local managers. I think the inequities you get there are just ridiculous, right? And that was true before. If you're working for manager A, you can work remotely. You could be doing exactly the same job for manager B. You can't there because manager B thinks you're watching Gilligan's Island when you're home and manager A is just interested in how much you get done. I mean, those inequities are going to be much worse if hybrid work becomes something that is really official, right? I think one of the things you can anticipate is a lot more complaints and a lot more grievances where people can grieve because they can't get access to remote work, either because their performance is not as good. You know, uh, Some companies are saying you have to have this level of performance to get access to hybrid work, which is a recipe for arguments. And others are saying my local manager has to determine it, whether I can do it or not based on quote need. And both of those I think are just gonna lead to lots of big arguments because for some people, this hybrid option is really, really valuable. And are they willing to file a grievance over this? Sure. Are they willing to sue you? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and so let's talk about that uh, in a little bit here. Um, here's the other thing, and then I'll start to wrap up, or Gene, if there are questions that you've been getting and you want to ping me, just let me stop here. Um, let's talk about real hybrid. So you've got half the people in the office, let's say half the people working remotely, maybe some of them permanent remote, others just working home more. How do you manage those people? Well, we know a fair bit from the telecommuting studies about the additional burdens on supervisors of managing people who are not in the office as much. They just have to give them a whole lot more help, you know, a whole lot more guidance as to what goes on, information as to what the politics look like, how are your stakeholders feeling about the project you're working on. You really need a lot more help. People in the office, how do you manage those people? Um, well, uh, differently. Now we're gonna, you know, and as we know, supervisors were pretty lousy at managing direct reports anyway. And now we're going to try to ask them to do it in two different ways. Um, doesn't sound like it's going to go well, right? 
in terms of scheduling things, uh, it is, if anything, even more complicated, right? Because so we got hybrid people, we're trying to get a meeting together on Monday, but uh, the problem is uh, people can work from home and people are not choosing the same days to work from home. So that ends up making schedules difficult. And even if you do things like, um, like Google, I think has said some of the companies, we got Tuesday and Thursday are work from home days. Um, you have to be in the other days. It sounds like it solves the problem, except that it might very well be the case that you really need a meeting on Tuesday. And uh, if you ask people to give up their work from home day for that meeting, uh, of course, that's in inequity of various kinds of ways. And uh, it's also the case that people want flexibility. And that means, look, I really want to be able to work remotely on Friday because my kid has this standing physical therapy appointment on Friday and it's really important to me. Work from home on Thursday doesn't do me any good. Uh, and you end up with this series of exceptions, which I think is likely to happen as well, right? Uh, we've already talked about the pay cut issue here. Um, and that is, uh, I guess the other thing too, is the social interaction of having everybody in the office becomes much more complicated with hybrid work. Let's say you hired a new person and you're trying to introduce them to people, but people are working on hybrid schedules three days a week. How long will it take for them to meet everybody? It take a very long time, right, uh, to do this. Right? Um, one thing where I think we could make some real obvious improvements is on sick days. We could reduce the need for sick days because, you know, right now, think of all the people who are kind of red carded, which is what we're calling it at Penn, you know, when you've got uh, a COVID exposure or something and they tell you to quarantine for a while. Most everybody could work from home in that context. Um, but are we allowing them to do it? I think under normal circumstances, you'd have to take a sick day or a PTO day of some kind, right? If we could allow more work from home days, we could reduce the number of sick days. And why does that help the employer? Because sick days, remember, are liabilities on the company's financial accounts. That's why the employer started screaming a little while ago, about, please take your sick days. It wasn't that they suddenly got interested in employer health. It was they had these big outstanding liabilities on their financial accounts. They were trying to get off the books uh, before the year end, right? So there might be some things we could do there which are pretty uh, useful. And I think also allowing people to work from home half a day, right? So I don't need to take a whole day of PTO for my doctor's appointment. Uh, it doesn't make sense for me to drive back into the office and then commute back home. By the time I do that in the afternoon, I've blown most of the day. But if I could work from home for half the day, I only need half a PTO day. So that might be good, right? Here's maybe some summary things here and just put some of these up uh, about individuals and advice to them about whether you should work from home if given the option, right? And the big thing here is, it, of course, it clearly depends on a bunch of things. Remote work succeeds best when the tasks are individual. The more collaboration you need, the worse it, it goes, right? So uh, that all makes kind of perfect sense. But there are some other judgments. And I think this number five one is the new one we should think about. There's been an explosion of interest by employers in Tattleware. And this is software that monitors whether you're actually at your desk or not. I just heard that Law firms are doing it now for some of their clerks and things, which is just ridiculous. So you're working from home, uh, but now you have to actually be at your desk from nine to five. The whole reason to be at home was so that you could take a, a break and walk the dog. and You didn't have to put your dog in doggy daycare and you can meet your kids at 3.30 when they come home from school and you can get them started. And you end up working after dinner maybe in order to get everything done, but that's cool. You much prefer that. If you've actually got to sit at your desk, all the advantage, I think, uh, of things that people liked about remote work, which was more control over your time, goes away, right? And we end up in these stupid wars. I don't know if you, you know this, but there's now software you can buy that will automatically jiggle your mouse to make it look like you're there. Uh, and you can, of course, most people already put tape over their camera so their employers can't see them. A third of American workers say they do that now. I mean, it just ends, I mean, it is so stupid, you know? I mean, this inability to trust your employees, but especially after 
all this work from home experience where very few employers report that their employees were goofing off. And yet now we're not going to trust them. I mean, it just seems bizarre to me, right? Um, so here are some other things to, to think about. Here's a legal issue you might want to get our hands around as employers. Who's going to raise their hand to want to work uh, remotely? Well, it's probably going to be more people with caregiving responsibilities. So that's probably going to be disproportionately women. And one of the things we know about remote work is remote workers end up doing worse in their careers. Right? So you've just created a quite likely adverse impact group with a demographic category who can sue you on a class action basis. Does that bother you if you're, you're an employer? It ought to. Uh, and then so we have to think, and I know this is one of the things that your group theory is going to think about, is how do we make sure that those folks have an experience which is more equal to those who are in the office? It's a big challenge. It's going to demand a lot from supervisors. But let me tell you one thing where we made some progress on this. During the pandemic, many employers required their supervisors to check in with their direct reports at least once a week and have a serious conversation about work. In the office, that rarely happens. You see your direct reports all the time, but you're talking about the weather or sports or gossip, but you're not talking about work very often. And they made it work. So one of my MBA students told me that he was supervising, you know, undergraduate new hires at one of the accounting firms. He said the, they required that each of those supervisors have a 15 minute discussion with their subordinates online every day, every day, right? So we could probably do a whole lot more to equalize the effects of people who are working remotely, but we have to be willing to do it. And so far, uh, we have not. If we look at how we appear to have just backed down from efforts to reform performance appraisals, right, which were really just trying to get people to talk more to each other. And most employers, I think, to be honest, even though I was one of the people pushing that, they kind of just gave up on it because it was too hard, right? So, you know, will employers take this seriously? I don't know. Maybe their general counsel could kind of persuade them uh, to do that. Uh, I got other things I could talk about, but why don't I pause here and see if we have things that you folks would like to raise or things you're seeing or questions about things maybe I have seen that I didn't get a chance to talk about. So Jeannie, let me turn it great. back uh, to you. We have that. quite a few questions, Peter. Uh, that okay. was fabulous. Oh, good. Really good overview. Um, I'm going to ask Edith Orenstein uh, to please ask her question. Thanks, Professor Wharton. Thanks, Professor Capelli, for a great presentation. No, My question you. is, I'm trying to capture a key sentence you said. I mean, I'd really like to quote you. And I want to know if I got it correct, where you either reference skills or experience. So what I think you said is, in the past, employers wanted a good candidate who they could train. The big yeah. change is employers want people to come in with the skills. Or yeah. did you say they want people to come in with the experience? Well, I think uh, I, I, what they said was uh, initially was we will train them. If they have the right attitudes, we will train them. And what they say now is we need the skills. If you press and say what skills matter, um, what skills seem to matter are work-based skills. They're not, as we know, all that interested in credentials per se they're interested in have you done the job before right and that seems to be driving everything so they're saying skills they probably mean work experience have so, you done this before Great. can i just my follow on to that then is just it's would you agree then that since our task force you know as the title is reskilling in the future of work yeah so yeah. is it really that built into reskilling if if there's an objective of getting people back into the workforce it's not just reskilling, but it's almost the concept of re-experiencing somehow, which could be internships or other. I think so. I think if you look at what employers actually look for, um, do they trust the credentials? It doesn't seem to be. You know, there's a bunch of paper, a bunch of studies and things on what recruiters do. There's a great paper uh, that just came out in BER that uh, Bo Calgill's the author. I know there are three authors. And they hired professional recruiters to screen resumes and see what they looked for. Uh, and you should look at that and, and see, I mean, one of the things for like middle management jobs that was really striking is they were 
first thing they looked at was your past salary. <laughs> it was like the, you know, much more so than, uh, you know, can you do the job uh, to try to get a sense, I guess, as to whether they could afford you or maybe how good your skills are. But they really seem focused on, if you read job ads, there must, he says, you must have experience with is a phrase you see in almost every job ad, right? Uh, and the experience with is not a credential thing. They want to know, have you done this before, right? And reading job ads is mind blowing, right? Because they're so incredibly specific about what they want, you know, yeah. must have experience with these machine tools, right? I mean, it's really experience, it's a specific stuff. Great question. So I think, yeah, yeah, I think you do have to talk about experience. Great, thank you. Uh, Eric's asking, are there insights from surveys regarding satellite offices and co-working spaces? Uh, about what they're doing, uh, Eric, is that the question? What is happening in satellite offices? Oh, well, the question is more towards the, I, I guess, move of, you know, how to use space and how to meet uh, in, 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 in employees where they are in this new uh, hybrid um, yeah. environment. Yeah, so, I mean, this is kind of one of the Google things, right? Is they're allowing you to move to satellite office, near satellite offices if you like, uh, or, or kind of willing to, to do that. Um, beyond that, I, I, don't, I don't see that as being something that they care much about. You know, you think about all this from the CFO's perspective and things become clear as to what's going on. And, and their question is, does this save us any money? The answer is maybe. Satellite offices are cheaper than corporate headquarters, typically, uh, and maybe they would like that. But they're already doing that, frankly. You know, like there's a survey, th this real estate survey I was telling you, where they they're talking about getting rid of private offices. They're also shrinking office size, but that's been going on for thirty or forty years, right? They've been shrinking the offices down little by little over over time. So I don't know that they've got a particular strategy for satellite offices, except that they are, they seem more willing to let people move around if they want. Great. Um, Katie Harmon from BASF is asking, um, how are companies taking the expectations of their customers into account when developing a hybrid digital work strategy? For example, if Sorry, if, for example, if our external customers are expecting more of a digital experience, we need to ensure our employees, managers are able to deliver on this, regardless of how challenging it might be. Yeah, so I think, uh, at least right now, of course, uh, a lot of uh, customers don't want you on their campus physically. Right? And so you have to be able to deliver that, right, if you're a customer contact person virtually because they don't want you visiting. I don't know how long that's gonna go on. Um, you know, one of the bets is that everybody gets used to this. And so now on travel is down and from now on meetings are gonna be down and all that stuff. I, I'm just not a good prognosticator on these things, you know, as to what's gonna happen. We've heard this kind of stuff for a while. Right. We heard it first when Lotus Notes came out in the late 1980s. And one of the things that, that actually happened with Lotus Notes, the communication software, was that travel went up afterwards because people discovered they had more reason to talk to people in other locations. So, you know, it puts a bigger burden on the vendor uh, to have to go visit clients. But if the clients say they want it, uh, I don't see the vendors saying, no, no. You can't be there in person. Um, they'll say, yes, ma'am, and off they'll go. So um, after the pandemic, I, I'm not betting that they're going to continue to want a digital experience as opposed to a face-to-face -face one. And at least what I can tell from customer-facing people, they still believe that face-to-face -face is the way to go. They may not be right on that, but as we know in organizations, it kind of doesn't matter whether people are right about these things. It's, you know, whether they're going to do them or not. You know, mm -hmm. we got very little work from home before the pandemic because employers thought it wouldn't work, thought everybody would be watching Gilligan's Island. Turns out they were wrong. Is that going to change a lot of minds? You would think so. But then we're seeing all this tattleware and we're seeing the employers starting to 
bring people back without a lot of change. So, you know, ideology is a big deal, right? Okay, great. Um, Ram, uh, do you want to make your comment? Yeah, so I think um, one size doesn't fit all. Um, so I think I, I, it's a great insights, uh, Professor Capelli. I, I, I have done some surveys and also part of the work reimagined group here at uh, Ernst Young. So I think what we are seeing, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts is uh, with uh, one size doesn't fit all. It's more for the employers and employees to come together a platform because uh, it has definitely shaken up uh, the boat in terms of uh, the work models. So there is a journey. It could be three months, six months, or a year journey with the employees and employees starting off and recalibrating what works, especially given that in the United States, I saw some survey, only about 40 or 45% could work from home. It's, uh, it's in the 40s, uh, anyone can work from home. The work remote index is something uh, being done everywhere. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, have you seen the calibration or a journey or a, uh, during a spectrum of time, this is uh, set, done right? Well, I think it's a great point about the process for doing this. Uh, and if I'm an employer, I think I want to tell everybody this is an experiment because we really don't know. Um, we don't know what's gonna happen with the virus. We don't know what's gonna happen with, um, uh, requirements, government requirements on this, and those things could change everything. And, you know, one of the problems, if you start changing things and creating expectations, pulling them back is very different, difficult to do. So I would tell everybody this is an experiment. I would also tell them on what criteria we're trying to figure things out. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's what we need to know before we can, you know, try to move in a different direction. The evidence from the Slack survey I was quoting suggests that unfortunately employers don't seem to be engaging their employees in these discussions at all. I mean, there are some that, that do uh, and that have done this quite carefully. Um, but uh, there's a difference too between surveying employees, a lot of employers say they're asking their employees and doing anything with the data, right? which yeah. is another thing to actually listen to them and do anything with it. Uh, and that's, a, that's not so clear. I think the one thing I worry about a little bit is this uh, office by office approach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which I think, can create and will create enormous inequities. Mm -hmm. um, unless you give the offices clear guidance as to what our rules are, and within this you can play around, maybe that's okay. But if you don't do that, I, I, think, I think honestly, it's just kind of kicking the can down the road on the part of the senior people to say, you guys go figure it out at the local level, because that's gotta be better. Well, as we know in dealing with employee issues, uh, issues of fairness, and equality matter a lot, and they're underpinned by laws that care about those things, right? So a local solution is, is going to get you in trouble on those issues, right? So I think employers have to think a little differently about that. I agree. Um, thank you. Uh, Maria has a question from the Heldridge Center for Workforce Development. Yes. Hi. Um, hi, Dr. Capelli. I guess my question is, there's a lot of evidence that employers, especially employers using automated hiring systems and ATS um, discriminate against long-term unemployed job seekers or individuals yeah. with a gap of six months or more. And since we know older workers are more likely to be long-term unemployed, can yeah. definitely impact their um, success as job seekers. So I guess my question is, given everything going on in the labor market right now, do you think employers are going to start to um, make some changes to those kinds of hiring platforms? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And, and I think maybe, Maria, you and I were quoted on this recently. Is that right? Is it? Yeah, okay, right. Uh, some reporters were saying they were getting a sense from recruiters that they were um, that they were not caring about this uh, anymore, right, during the pandemic. I, I think it's going to be a little different. It's like, you know, the evidence about plant closing versus layoffs. Larry Katz and the company's paper on that a long time ago, you know, that if it's so clearly not your fault, it's not surprising people lost their job at the beginning of the pandemic, it had nothing to do with them. Is there more tolerance for this because it's so widespread? and let's believe that it must have been something about you, right? Um, so I think there will be more tolerance for this going forward. Uh, the thing I find that's more interesting question, I'll lead in and ask it is, 
what's going to happen to people who quit their jobs because they won't get vaccinated, right? And how do you explain that gap in your um, in your resume? And I think that's not going to play out so well for people in the future. You know, if you say uh, I quit because I wasn't vaccinated, you know, at the moment. Nobody wants to touch that one, but I think it's gonna look increasingly selfish and stupid as time goes on. And instead of that, I think you're gonna see resumes say self-study and international travel or something like that for that gap in their careers rather than I didn't wanna get vaccinated. Uh, just one other thought on your first um, breakout group uh, topic that I would just want you to make sure you push is the work opportunities tax credit that I had uh, a hand in over the last um, six or seven years pushing along as a way to try to get people opportunities, people long-term unemployed and other folks, because that's something that gets ignored by a lot of employers. Great. We'll check that out. Absolutely. So um, any other final questions? Raise your hand if you have a comment or a question, or if you want to chat it. This has been really incredibly enlightening, and um, we appreciate everybody's time. Don't see any hands at the moment. So uh, with that, I'm going to thank Peter and uh, we really appreciate it. And we're going to uh, move into our breakouts. Peter, if, if we could possibly share the charts, we will share the recording, but uh, we'll also share the charts if that's okay. Uh, sure, you, you have them or you want me to give them to you or? No, yeah, you need, could you email them to us? Yeah. Okay, okay. perfect. Thank yeah. you. And okay. we will, we Very really good. are grateful. You're incredibly um, insightful. I loved your book. I love both your, all your books and your articles. So. Oh, good. Thank you all very much. Good luck with this. Important it's stuff. been great. Thank you Thank so you. much, Peter. Bye-bye. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we have three groups and you can choose which group you would like to join, three breakout groups. Um, I'll be facilitating the first one on how can human resource hiring practices be revisited to provide greater opportunities for underemployed or long-term unemployed. And Peter just mentioned the work opportunities tax credit um, and uh, lots of other issues that are relevant. And group two will, just, will be facilitated by Sam Couchy from One Huddle and he'll be talking about upskilling employees whose jobs may be reduced or eliminated due to uh, all sorts of things, automation, AI, et cetera. And how can we upskill them to teach them the skills they need now and for the future and make sure that they are uh, employed. And group three to be facilitated by Noah Gaffney is going to focus on a lot of what uh, actually Peter was just teeing up about how can we ensure that workers returning to remote and hybrid environments have equal opportunities for advancement as those who return to the office. I thought his comments were quite uh, important on, in that regard. All right, so Deborah's gonna tee up the breakout rooms and uh, we'll take a one minute break for We have Kyle, Director of Economic Policy Research at awesome. NJBIA. Okay, and then uh, Noah, who's going to be debriefing from your group? There were no takers, so I will be debriefing. Okay. All right. So it looks like people are back. And so we had a super exciting and interesting uh, and productive conversation. And so I'm going to ask Maria to uh, share what we talked about. You're on mute, Maria. Maria, you're on mute. OK. Let's, let's try that again. Sorry, I um, was trying to look at my notes at the same time, so didn't see that I was on mute. Um, no problem. We did have a very interesting conversation and could have gone on for much longer. Um, our main topic was how 
Uh, can HR hiring practices provide better opportunities for long-term un unemployed and underemployed and really other applicants at this point? Um, we talked a bit about starting with what, what uh, Dr. Capelli was saying around how employers used to be willing to hire people out of school, maybe without experience, with the understanding that, that they would provide training on the job, but now increasingly, um, and it's probably been true for a while, they, they want exact skills, um, they, they, they want demonstrated experience. So it, it has the effect of um, limiting people they will consider. Um, we talked about really how to get HR to think more about the work that needs to get done, the specific tasks that need to get accomplished rather than exactly what's on um, somebody's, um, what credentials that they have. Um, let's see, that companies are not looking as much at, at what skills people need. And of course, given future of work trends and changing technologies, they probably should be less wedded to um, a specific skill and be willing to think about training and mentoring people on the job. Uh, we also talked about if recruiters are looking at your last salary, um, that's another way that they might just overlook applicants who could do the job. We talked a little bit about skills-based hiring. Um, and we also talked about whether employers need incentives like the work opportunity tax credit or other kinds of subsidies to hire from some of these groups that get um, often overlooked. I'm not sure we settled that we seem to have a, a difference of opinions about how useful some of those are, but certainly it's something to be looking at. Um, we talked about there seems to be a, almost a, a duality or dichotomy right now between this idea of tattleware and suspicious employers versus um, at the same time maybe more trust and, and allowing people to have more autonomy in their work, and that may make them more productive and, and happier workers. Um, let me see, we, 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 we talked about, given all of that, how can we start to rebuild the employment relationship? Um, I mean, maybe we need to think about new ways of hiring in the context of um, corporate sustainability and responsibility initiatives. Um, let me see, I just I took a lot of notes here. We talked a bit about uh, compensation issues and that we need more analysis of metrics. Um, we probably need more data on the cost of hiring people with, with the, some skills who can be mentored and learn on the job versus spending extra time to hire people who may have the perfect fit. Um, I'm not sure if I've captured that quite right, but someone from our group can jump in and rephrase it if I didn't. Um, we need to reinvent the interviewing process. Um, and, and we talked about a lot about ATS, the applicant tracking systems and, and these other automated hiring tools. Um, applicants don't have human interaction until they reach a certain step in the process. And then that makes it very hard to have inclusive and diverse hiring opportunities. Um, and let me see, I, I think those were, those were most of my notes. So I will stop there, happy to, to uh, take any questions. And anybody from the group, please feel free to jump in. But I think some of us have committed to now working on a team to develop some um, guidelines for new employment relationships. Great. So Maria did a phenomenal job of covering our conversation. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to open up that last opportunity because this was kind of an epiphany uh, for me and the group and everybody, a lot of people raised their hand to, we're actually gonna work on a new drafting uh, document that represents a new employment relationship. So anybody that would like to participate in that, please uh, send me an email or you can chat it now and we'll capture it. And we'll form a sub team to work on that. I actually had done that in my previous company and um, I, we have lots of ideas and we'll cover a lot of the things that Maria just mentioned. So with that, um, let me turn it over to um, Sam, who's gonna turn it over to Kyle. 
for group two. Sure. Sure. And we had a we had an action action pack session. I'm gonna hand it right over to Kyle to talk about upskilling employees whose jobs may be reduced or eliminated. Great. Thanks, Sam. We uh, we did. We had we had a lively conversation. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and cover as much as I can. I apologize to our group if uh, if I leave anything out that seems important. Please feel free to jump in. So I think our, our conversation centered a lot around um, number one, how do we motivate both employers and employees to take part in upskilling and reskilling, and then also specifically, how do we overcome the barrier on the employer side? Um, with regard to this idea that if I invest in upskilling or reskilling for uh, new hires or uh, recent hires, that they will within two or three years turn around and take a job somewhere else, and I won't see the return on the investment that I made. So um, one thing that we talked a lot about was this idea of becoming the, the inherent benefit of becoming an employer who is recognized for investing in their company and that that makes employees want to stay with you. It makes them want to come to you. And uh, it often creates better employees because they have that feeling of connection and worth from their employer. Um, off of that, we heard about a really great program that takes place at Audible. Unfortunately, Pam from Audible had to jump before we had a chance to come back together. She mentioned a program that they have um, that brings people in and trains them on transferable skills before they ever have a job with the company. And at the end of that program, I forget if it was six weeks or eight weeks or how long she said it was, but at the end, they have the opportunity to apply for positions with the company. Um, she said in their experience, those who make it into employment with Audible end up being some of their best employees, some of the most active in terms of promoting the company and all the good it's doing. Um, and, and that those who don't are not seen as a lost investment because they go off and either come back later because they have this great conception of the company, or they're just productive in their regional economy or in their community elsewhere. And that ultimately, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. We did have a little bit of a conversation uh, later in the, the session about if that model was scalable. And if you could break part of the barrier for companies by creating either a public private partnership or a partnership among multiple private companies to provide a similar training model but because it is a collaborative, you would reduce the cost to each individual employer to bring these folks in. And now they can apply to five different companies instead of one. And there's uh, not so much of this lost investment concern on the employer side. Um, I do want to just mention that we did talk about the need to um, create employees or prospective employees, members of our labor force, um, who have an entrepreneurial mindset um, and who are actively aware of their own needs for upskilling and reskilling while we were still being conscious of the barriers that exist to accomplishing that, especially for some of our lower wage, lower level workers who may be in food service or retail working two jobs and trying to find the time to take part in these programs, even if they're aware of what they need to be doing. Um, so certainly there were some, some brief ideas and disagreements about whether um, there were tax incentives that needed to be in place for the businesses to create these opportunities or whether we need, you know, whether this is a minimum wage conversation so the folks don't have to be working two jobs and they can have those evening hours to, to take part in these programs. Um, there was also just briefly some discussion about, um, you know, how individual companies can create these reskilling or upskilling opportunities that move uh, horizontally and not just vertically. So training folks not only to, to be promoted and to make more money, but to take on other responsibilities within the company. And there were discussions about how that actually increases your potential longevity as the needs of employers and as the needs of the economy change, because now you're able to jump horizontally between positions um, as certain things become uh, reduced or eliminated. So I'll stop there. I don't know if I've missed anything anybody wants to jump in or if anybody else has has questions from outside of the group. That was fantastic. Anybody want to add anything? Okay, great. Well, we captured this and we're recording and we'll summarize in notes. So thank you. And last but not least, Noah Gaffney, the Executive Director of the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation. 
All right, thank you all. Um, a lot of what we talked about was mentioned in the previous groups as well. So I'm just going to jump bucket it into four key categories. The first one is it goes back to employee trust and employer trust, right? And so one of our colleagues mentioned about her role as a supervisor and how it was really important for her to show that trust with employees who were remote and that it really paid back in spades and that people were just as productive as their peers and there was really no gap between those who were remote and those who were face to face and this is even before the pandemic. Um, the second thing we talked about was around technology and technology has a lot of pros right so one of our colleagues said that can we imagine what would have happened if this pandemic would have taken place 20 years ago the technology wasn't there on the other hand the technology still isn't there and so one of our colleagues who's a professor at rbs mentioned how certain students are having a hard time getting the appropriate level of bandwidth to participate in class other students have backgrounds where you know they don't want to show their camera and of course you know there are things about technology which are inherited inherently inequitable for example um, zoom backgrounds don't show up as well there's not as much of a contrast on darker skin so even things like putting a zoom background isn't necessarily this panacea solution that we would like to think it is right so i think as much as we like to think that there are opportunities in technology we also have to recognize the challenges and so two things that we talked about as solutions the first is obviously training um, it's very clear that those who are remote in a hybrid world are not necessarily as visible, right? And I think this is compounded when the people who choose to stay at home may already not be as visible for other reasons, whether it's their gender or socioeconomic status or race and ethnicity. So there are a lot of things that um, maybe make them less visible already. And so training around how to be more visible online and how to present in this new way can be something that helps. And then ultimately we talked about, it really comes back to culture and it comes back to creating this culture of belonging. And so if you have a culture of FaceTime and you expect everybody post COVID to come in five days a week and stay really late, you know, you're know you you're obviously not well placed to have a culture of belonging and you're not really going to make sure that the diverse workforce who is not necessarily in the office is succeeding either. So that was really the, the crux of our discussion. And so I think it, it comes down to things like trust, belonging, and understanding the pros and cons of technology and even training. Great. Okay, that was fantastic. Good summary. So I think we've covered uh, all of the three questions, and I'll just open it up in our last couple of minutes to say thank you. And does anybody have anything you'd like to add to anything we've discussed today? We will summarize it, and I'm going to follow up uh, for our next meeting with um, some uh, some work on this new employment relationship and anything else that people would like to contribute, please send your materials to uh, me and Deborah at rixie.director. And um, we've been keeping this really amazing list of uh, resources, which we will continue to update. Our next meeting is December 14th on Tuesday, not Wednesday. Uh, from 10 to 12, and that will be our final meeting of this year. And what we'll be doing is synthesizing what we've done uh, for the last uh, six months or year and proposing our next steps for 2022. If there's anything that anyone particularly would like to share for a few minutes on the next uh, call, please let us know and we can factor that into our planning. We really would appreciate it. So any other final comments from anyone? Looking at the chat, Audible, um, John Sarno, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Okay. Yeah, Audible was sharing on the call. That was great. Would you like to say anything, John? Um, only that, um, well, I apologize for my lateness, but I, I did benefit from this this uh, late, um, this dr uh, great discussion. So um, looking good, looking forward to the next meeting and looking forward to the agenda for next year. There's just, I was just at the, um, the uh, Employment and Training Commission 
meeting and that's why I was late. There's a lot of great work being done in this space. So I think we're in the right place at the right time. Excellent. Okay, well, it's always a pleasure. Uh, thank you everybody. And we'll see you uh, in a few weeks. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you.